Here we present the surgical technique for implant-mediated guided growth, which was used for this skeletally immature patient with patellofemoral instability and asymmetric genuvalgum. We position the patient supine on a radiolucent table and apply a tourniquet to the thigh, but we typically don't inflate it during the case. Fluoroscopy comes in from the ipsilateral side and the surgeon stands on the opposite side because they're working on the medial side of the knee. We also have a sterile bump which is useful for getting lateral x-rays. We start by marking the level of the physis using fluoroscopy because this establishes the level of the incision. On a perfect lateral view we also mark the anatomical axis of the femur and you can see on the right image here that uh, the intersection of the mechanical axis of the femur or the anatomical axis of the femur and uh, the level of the physis is the location of our incision, uh, which again is centered over the physis. Typically we make a two centimeter skin incision uh, in that location, however this can be affected by the patient's body habitus. We dissect down uh, to the VMO where the interval between the VMO and the posterior structures is developed by elevating the VMO anteriorly, and then this plane can be further carried down to the level of the periosteum and is anterior to the MCL origin. I like to avoid the use of electrocautery around the physis as to not permanently damage or cause iatrogenic injury to the periphyseal ring. Once down on the physis, we typically place a guide wire right at the level of the physis. Uh, we check this on the AP view, and then on the lateral view, a clamp is used in order to see where the pin is entering the physis. You can see here it's marked by the red dot, and we just make sure that this is in line with the anatomical axis of the femur on the lateral view because this is where we want the plate to be centered and aligned. Typically we use a two-hole plate, but four-hole plates are also available. I usually like to contour this with bending irons in order uh, for it to fit the medial side of the distal femur more anatomically and rest down on the periosteum. After contouring the plate, it's then uh, slid down the wire uh, to rest at the um, physis um, on the level of the bone, and then this allows us to look and make sure it's an appropriate size. At this point, we take a variable angle drill guide and place it in one of the holes, typically the epiphyseal hole uh, of the plate in order to rotate the plate to be in line with the femoral axis as seen on the lateral projection. We then use it to direct a guide wire into the appropriate position. Once it's down to the appropriate depth, I then check a lateral view. After placing the epiphyseal guide wire, again I go to a perfect lateral projection of the knee, and I like to ensure that the tip of the guide wire is contained anterior to Blumensatz line and posterior to the lateral projection of the deepest part of the trochlear sulcus which ensures that the screw, the eventual screw, will remain completely interosseous and not violate the notch. I then go back to the AP view uh, in order to place the guide wire for the metaphyseal screw and then measure both guide wires in order to obtain the appropriate screw lengths. I like to use solid screws, uh, but when I drill, I drill in a cannulated fashion. I use the cannulated drill bit to first drill the epiphyseal screw and then the guide wire is completely removed and the epiphyseal solid screw is placed. Because there's a proximal metaphyseal guide wire as well as a central wire in the plate, the plate really shouldn't rotate out of position while removing the guide wire and inserting the screw. I then advance the screw down to the level of the plate, but I do not tighten it. I follow the same steps for the proximal metaphyseal screw, so I drill it in a cannulated fashion, remove the wire, and then place that screw down to the level of the plate. Prior to final tightening, I remove the central guide wire so that the plate can rest anatomically on the cortex of the medial distal femur. The screws are sequentially tightened back and forth so that the plate comes down to rest on the medial distal femur. Prior to final tightening, I like to go and cycle the knee from full extension to full flexion in order to make sure that there's no entrapped tissue underneath the plate that could block range of motion or capture the knee, and then I go down and final tighten the screws. This is what it looks like on final AP and lateral fluoroscopic views. You can see on the lateral view that the plate is in line with the anatomic axis of the distal femur and that the tip of the epiphyseal screw is contained anterior to Blumensatz line and posterior to the lateral projection of the deepest part of the trochlear sulcus. If indicated, a medial tibial plate can also be performed using a similar technique in order to gain additional correction. In this patient, given the amount of growth remaining and the amount of correction that was required, we decided to do both distal femur and proximal tibia guided growth. Postoperatively, the patient can be weight-bearing and range of motion is tolerated and less limited by concomitant procedures.